Okay, so, so we now have our mortgage pool that represents a thousand loans and a hundred cities or towns. And so it's a large pool of which we've sliced up initially into all these little pieces that may go back and maybe the largest piece was taken by Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac and other pieces were taken by other investors in the marketplace. The problem with those is investors who bought a piece of a pool didn't really know when they were going to get their money back because each of these loans is going to pay and prepay whenever the person pays their mortgage. And of course that means that could be when they, when they die or when they move most often or when they buy a new house or any number of reasons they could prepay their mortgages. So even those, those are 30-year those are mortgages, really in fact they very rarely live for 30 years. In fact, uh, oftentimes the, what's, what's known as the average life of a mortgage was maybe 8 to 12 years. So the problem is, here you are an investor, well, you don't know. I mean, you're, am I, if I need, if I want to, if I, if I want to make an investment and I want to want that money for my retirement or to pay for my school in eight years or my school in four years, right, this is kind of an uncertain payoff instrument and really does not represent a good investment for me. And so what they decided to do is they decided, okay, instead of cutting up the mortgages these ways, so everybody gets a slice of every single mortgage that's exactly identical, everybody gets the same slice, they decided to slice them the other way. And in particular, what they did is they said, okay, we're going to slice them the other way and we're going to make it so that, in this simple example, we have three tranches. Now, we're going to make it so that not only do we have three tranches, but we have three tranches that have different priority. So the first priority, this is the, this is the priority one tranche, this is the priority two, and this would be priority three tranche. Now the priority one tranche is going to get all the payments first. All the principal payments that are going to come are going to get paid to the priority one tranche first. Now what that means is those guys are going to have a loan, which still have a little bit of uncertainty maturity, but it might be, might be uh, two to three years. Right, so it's no longer eight to 12 years, now it's two to three years, and it got rated by the rating agencies triple A, meaning that it's no more risky than U.S. Treasury bonds because even though we know, we talked before about the fact that some of these homes are going to default and not pay their mortgages back, well, that's going to get born first by the number three tranche guys, then by the number two tranche guys. So in fact, these guys, even if there's a large number of defaults or problems, they're going to get their money back. And this is an unlevered instrument which means that there's, so, so, that, so that you could basically, if you owned a dollar's worth of this, uh, you know, of, of, of the whole pool, you might own, say, 80 cents uh, of this AAA tranche, and that's a, that's, a, that's a pretty secure thing. And then there's a second tranche here, which is going to be a triple B rated tranche, right? And triple B is still investment grade, but it means that there's certainly now some risk of default. And this third tranche is really what we're going to call equity, and it might only represent uh, three to five percent of the total loan. So lots of people wanted this number one tranche, right? That was an attractive AAA investment for a lot of different parties. It turned out that the people originating the loans and some hedge funds and speculators thought this number three tranche was a pretty good risk. It had a, it had a lot of risk, but also had a lot of expected return in it. And the triple, the second tranche. This triple B tranche actually found fewer homes. People were not so happy with that. There weren't so many natural buyers of those, of those securities. So what they did is, and this, this is where the financial engineering, the magic, really starts to happen in the mortgage market. What they did is they took all those triple B tranches from a bunch of different deals, and they put them together in a new pool. So now this pool, which we're going to call a CDO, this first pool we call the pass-through, this new pool, which we're going to call the CDO, is actually made up of a large number of triple B tranches. Now, 
made up a large number of triple B palm trees, you might think, reasonably, that they would be rated triple B. But what they did is they did the same strategy where they divided it up into a number one tranche, a number two tranche, and a number three tranche. And amazingly, the rating agency decided the number one tranche would be rated triple A because, of course, it's backed up. Although the triple Bs might have defaults, it's backed up by the three tranche and the two tranche. Now, in the early days of the subprime crisis, in the early days of the subprime lending, actually, I apologize, the, take that back again. In, in the early days of mortgage lending, you might think that it would be normal to have a 1% or 2% default rate. And you might think that you're going to have losses when you default of, uh, say, you're, you're going to have losses of maybe, say, 30% loan loss. Right? That would mean if you had a 2% default rate with a 30% loan loss, right, you're going to lose 30% of 2%, which is only, uh, which, which, which is only 0.6%. And 0.6% out of this whole thing means that you haven't even really nibbled much into this, into this, into this number three tranche. Pretty secure investment. The problem is, and of course you haven't gotten anywhere near this triple B tranche, and these CDOs look perfectly safe. The problem is that with subprime mortgages, the initial expectations were that you might see default rates as high as about 15%, and you might see loan losses as high as about 30%. Let's, let's go with 33%, 33 and a third percent just to make the math easy. So you would expect your loss then to be have a 5% loss. Well, a 5% loss, now you've nibbled in pretty significantly into, if these, this is all subprime mortgages, you've nibbled into this area pretty significantly, but you still have this area and still, you know, and certainly, and, and, then, and then of course even if it nibbles in a little bit here, it kind of nibbles in over here. So these guys still look pretty secure. The problem is, and what made subprime mortgages so popular, is that initially they did not experience 15% defaults and 33 and a third percent loan losses, what they actually experienced was actually about 1% or 2% defaults, and they experienced loan losses of about 10%, which means instead of losing 5%, which was the expectation, and that's why they charge subprime borrowers a higher interest rate to compensate them for this expected 5% loss, they actually only experienced losses of about 0.2%. Oh, 0.2%, that's practically nothing. And of course, those original guys who made subprime mortgages, they, they, were, they were pretty adventurous. And their bosses said, well, you can't make much, much subprime loans because, you can't make many subprime loans because, you know, it's risky. And what they, but those were the guys that made a ton of money. So here you have some loan officer that said, boss, boss, I want to make a few subprime loans. I think I can make some money with these things. Uh, I'm, uh, even though I'm expecting a 5% loss, I'm going to charge interest rate more than compensates that. I'm going to charge interest rate, interest rate that's 3% uh, higher per year for the expected life of 8 to 12 years, which more than compensates me for my 5% expected loss when there's a default. And what he really gets is not a 5% loss. He actually gets a 0.2% loss. His boss says, gosh, Mr. Loan Officer. You just, you, you out, outshined everybody in the bank. Your part of the portfolio made more money than any other part of the portfolio we have in the bank. What do you think the bank officer did? Well, he did more of it. And of course, what we observed is from the years about 2000 to 2007 first half, right, subprime mortgage issuance skyrocketed. Skyrocketed because it was so profitable. Really, because it was so profitable because they experienced so few losses. The problem, of course, is the reason they experienced so few losses really had to do not with the fact that there weren't problems among the subprime borrowers, but it's just that a subprime borrower who ran into trouble, instead of defaulting on their loan because their house had gone up in value over this exact same time period, they sold the house instead.